Good afternoon, everybody. Hope lunch was good for you. Uh, this is a little bit di different from the rest of the briefings we got today. It's a little bit more uh, technology oriented, uh, but it's how we're applying it to farms. So uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Terrence Hunt. I uh, started Adev Automation in 2017. Okay, so I started this company uh, about uh, 2017, a few years ago. Um, uh, to address the, the obvious labor shortage issues that are happening in the agriculture industry. And back in 2017, there was definitely an issue then, and then COVID hit, and it suddenly became more of a problem. Um, so today I'm going to start uh, with something you know a whole lot about, uh, labor issues in the United States, and then I'm going to go into how, how I see uh, robotic harvesting will influence farms uh, in the future, uh, and more how it really... <laughs> It's almost an inevitability that uh, strawberry, fruit, and vegetable farms will move in the same direction that the grain farms moved in years ago and moving from uh, manual labor to uh, robotic labor or autonomous labor in the future to harvest the plants. Um, so I'm an engineer by trade. I uh, went to school for a bunch of years and learned about how to use uh, robotics to do robotics and ele electrical engineering and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and uh, I, found, I finally decided to go into business on my own to address uh, issues that I thought was important. It's always nice to do what you think is important instead of what somebody else thinks is important. And uh, so since 2017, I've built several prototypes. Uh, started The first one I built was that uh, small robot up there, which is mostly just to see if there was the technology available and at a reasonable cost to find strawberries and pick them. Uh, obviously, once you take that to the field, you have a whole new set of problems. Uh, and so uh, over the years, I have redesigned the robot three times to uh, become more uh, applicable in the field. Um, and really, uh, operating in the variable environment that's outside has been a major influence. In addition to the technology available, I have to, it has to work outside in the sun and the dark and the rain and the cold all the time. Uh, and that is really the core of what is enabling mechanical harvesting now is, is the technology is finally available at a reasonable cost to enable uh, to, uh, mechanical harvesting at a reasonable cost. Um, something that I probably know the least about in this room is farm labor. I know enough to know that it's a big problem and that it's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, I know that the H-2A problem, H-2A program has solved labor problems to a large extent and, and enables uh, farmers to get the labor they need to do harvesting. Um, but I've heard a lot about how it's rather expensive and difficult to manage and a little bit problematic in that the rules change every year and you never really know what's coming down the pike next as far as how to acquire H-2A labor in the coming years. And even despite the H-2A program, labor costs are continuing to rise and the labor pool is continuing to shrink which means that in the future, in the next uh, number of decades, uh, in order for American strawberry business to stay viable, we're going to need a mechanical harvesting solution to come into fruition. And this is, uh, and th this presentation is my idea of how to solve this problem. Um, and this just chart shows what you already know, but not everybody is aware of, that strawberries are a huge portion of all berry sales in the United States. It's a, $3 billion industry, which is attractive to any kind of investor when you start talking numbers like that. Um, and despite the labor pool shrinking, the demand ke keeps growing. So we have you know, either things are getting more expensive or we're going to start exporting strawberry growers to other countries to solve that shortage. And I'd like to not export them to other countries. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about what the barriers are, like why don't we have robotic harvesting for strawberries and other fruits like we do for corn. And you guys all know all about it, but uh, strawberries are very difficult to pick without damaging. Their shelf life isn't quite the same as grain. Uh, and uh, the current solutions that anyone's come up with are rather expensive. I, I've looked at uh, some research papers on the estimated cost of a strawberry harvester today. You've probably heard of a few strawberry harvesting machines that are currently out there. None of them are commercially viable right now. None of them are currently operating and picking strawberries for our farm. But some of them are very close, but they are also very expensive. They say 
the only cost estimate I saw was a $500,000 cost estimate, which I'm sure is just a shot in the dark. It's in that general ballpark for how much uh, robotic harvester costs right now. And this is a very large, oriented towards very large farms. Goal, their goal is to target, you know, replacing huge, large groups of workers at once. Um, the problem is it's a very long return on investment. When you spend that kind of money up front, it's going to take you a while to make your money back, and you re really just have to have faith that that robot is going to continue to work and perform as advertised for 10 years in the future. Um, the idea I came up with is to give farmers another choice, another alternative to that, especially farmers who don't have you know, 500 acres of strawberries out there. Maybe you only have 50, and having a half a million dollar harvester isn't a good solution. Um, the alternative is to hire a company that doesn't sell you a robot, but sells you the harvesting services instead. And that's what the company I started with, their goal is to, instead of sell a robot, we're gonna sell harvesting services. So instead of hiring H2A to come in and har harvest strawberries for you, you'll hire additive automation to come in and, and harvest and reduce your labor. So part of our goal is not to replace manual labor, but to kind of slowly phase manual labor out and mechanical labor into the, the practice. Um, and also, instead of selling you robots, we just sell you services. So when you hire of Automation, we're enabling a farm to cut its labor force uh, dramatically. We're talking cut labor force by 50% to harvest the same number of strawberries from, compared to what you have now. And by doing this, we keep, the, we keep and maintain all the harvesters, and we're able to reutilize the harvesters on different farms throughout the year. So by having the harvesters small and lower cost, we have more of them to do the same amount of work, but it also enables us to load them up and ship them to different farms during the year for a relatively low cost, so we can utilize the farms for eight to 10 months a year instead of just a few weeks of the year or a few months out of the year. And that lets us get a faster return investment on the robots, and it lets us offer farmers a lower rate for doing mechanical harvesting. Um, the other barriers are technology barriers. Um, the robot we have out in the hallway uh, uses li a LiDAR sensor to find and track strawberries. And in the past, LiDAR has been, it's not a new technology, but it's a very expensive technology. Up until the last five years, the only way to have a LiDAR system was to build it yourself, write all your own software interfaces, and then produce it. And that is a very expensive process. I have two pictures down there. One of them is a military system who did exactly that. They spent probably $50 million designing, building, and producing this piece of hardware for military purposes. And you know, it's an incredibly expensive process, and it's a very large, specific uh, sensor. And on the right, you have when the Intel released earlier, well, I guess last year in 2021, and uh, that cost $500. And it does effectively the same thing at much shorter range, but that's a totally new capability and a very small size. It fits in the palm of your hand as opposed to being a very large object with a very specific purpose. But the point of me talking about this is this really is the difference between a $500,000 robot and a $50,000 robot because the sensors drive the cost of those machines. It's not all those big metal parts, it's the sensors that have to find the strawberries. That is the bread and butter, that's the secret sauce in there. So for the robot we developed out there, in order to speed the delivery of the service to the farmer, we aren't delivering a perfect solution. Like I said, we aren't delivering a robot that does everything. Our goal is to have replace one manual laborer, or we're replacing two manual laborers with one manual laborer and uh, a mechanical harvester. So we're simply cutting the amount of labor required by 50%. So we're replacing one person, one set, so one half of a person is being replaced with the robot. So if you have one robot and one laborer, now you have the same amount as two laborers, except you have to hire fewer laborers. Um, and you'll see here, this is actually a video that we made last week uh, at a field test we did uh, at the University of Florida. And uh, it shows us harvesting a single strawberry. And you'll see it's not super fast compared to a person. Uh, kind of hesitates and goes slowly. There's a lot of room for speed improvements. Um, but by building a system that isn't perfect, uh, we will actually deliver a system to the farmers 
um, instead of waiting till the perfect system is available, which never actually occurs, and then farmers never get the products they need. So that is kind of our solution to the robotic problem. We're delivering an imperfect solution that needs people to help it work. And uh, the second main focus of the robot is we're focused on reducing the cost and increasing the manufacturability of the system, uh, which really cuts, starts to cut down the cost. So all of our parts are available in large quantities. So if you say, hey, this is great, we need to build 100 of them, we can order parts for 100. We don't have any custom handmade parts or anything like that in there. It's all stuff you can just buy and assemble, and you can load the software that we've developed onto it, and it will work. Um, our solution is essentially, we don't say, here's how much the robot costs. We say, here's how much we're going to charge you for a flat of strawberries that we're, we're harvesting. So if you have one worker and one strawberry harvester working together, we can charge you this rate per flat that those two combined uh, services will, will produce. Um, so you, don't need to, you still need to hire some workers, but you don't need to hire as many. So our assumption is that by reducing your dependence on manual labor, we're making your lives easier and increasing, effectively increasing the labor pool for everybody, which should hold labor costs down. Uh, and as the, our, as the technology matures to increase the means to pick strawberries and reduce the dependence on manual labor, we'll slowly be phasing out the manual labor aspect of strawberry harvesting, not just jumping off a cliff and hoping that the technology works with very few workers. So we're, we, I just envision uh, a future where we slowly transition away from manual labor instead of rapidly transitioning away. Um, the scalability, uh, our goal is to have one harvester do the work of one, one field worker. And, uh, and again, the farmers won't have to maintain any of the equipment. They won't have to maintain, they won't have, they won't have to store them or anything. All you have to do is uh, pay for the strawberries that are harvested for you. And, it seems like it'd be lower risk for the farmer and they kind of know what they're getting now instead of getting a machine they have to learn how to use. Uh, the, uh, there, are also, there are a few drawbacks to this. Uh, if you want to keep the machine, for example, that is also an option. And by utilizing the robot in many different farms, you have to adapt the robot to many different farms. So often machines will be adapted to a specific farm layout environment. Um, but to, in order for us to work on different farms across the United States, they're not all exactly the same. They're not all double rows spaced at the same spacings. They're not all plastic culture. So we have to have the robot be adaptable to these different environments. But we think we've solved that problem. So here is our business plan. Um, starting in December, uh, notice this is when they plant the strawberries uh, in the different zones. Um, but in Florida, they start harvesting in December until March. They have a nice long harvesting period in Florida. And then moving north from there, um, when you get in Tennessee, Kentucky, and Ohio, you're now doing the May-June time frame, depending on how hot it is that year. The strawberries will be ready for harvesting between May and June between Tennessee and Ohio. And then you go up north farther into Michigan and Minnesota, and you start getting June, July, and if you go high enough north, you get into even some August strawberries in there. So by using that plan, we can stay on the East Coast, move our harvesters from south to north during the season, and utilize them for maybe nine, 10 months of the year, instead of just having them ready for one month a year, used to harvest for a month or two in Florida, or a week or two in Ohio, and uh, just have them sit in the garage the rest of the time not being used. That's not a very effective way of, it doesn't give you much return or investment if they're not being used 80% of the year. So our plan is to use it for as much of the year as possible on as many farms as possible, and that gives us the leverage to uh, get our return investment as fast as possible and reduce the rates that we have to charge farmers to harvest the strawberries. Um, as I alluded to before, there have been some recent advancements that enable the technology. Mainly the LiDAR it reduces the number of sensors we need to find, locate, and harvest the strawberries. And the other less recent but much more mature now technology is 3D printing, uh, which you may be aware of. There's a lot of 3D printing houses in the United States where I can 
take a uh, part that I have modeled in the CAD. So the robot out there is completely modeled in software and a CAD drawing. So I can take any part from that model, send it to a 3D warehouse, and have them print that part, as many as I need, at a relatively low cost. This enables me to scale up production fairly easily, and it also lets me make any kind of custom part uh, fairly quickly, as long as I know what it needs to be. So if I need to make a part specific to a certain type of farm, I can make a lot of those parts at a fairly low cost out of materials like aluminum or a durable type of plastic that would be uh, farm worthy, that can survive the elements. Uh, the other uh, main advancement that has occurred lately is in the brain of the robot is a computer. And to do all the processing, to take all the information from all the sensors we have, we have five cameras on the robot outside, and we also have some guidance systems, and then control of all the motors in there that move the arm and the wheels. Uh, they all are connected to this computer. And it has to be, have a, be a fairly high speed advanced computer. And recently they've taken some of the most powerful desktop processors like the Intel i7s and i9s and they've been able to put them in little boxes and sell them at a relatively low price compared to what they've been able to do in the past. So this lets us take a very powerful processor and put it in the robot at a low cost and produce the product. And we don't have to uh, spare any any type of processing technology. We can use anything we want to process the images and do it as fast as we need to do it to pick strawberries. And uh, the other side of it is the software side. Um, this software isn't simple, but it does let us take those new technology, new hardware technology, and bring it to market quickly. It lets us rapidly integrate new sensors and new technology and generate a product fairly quickly. Um, so the final question is, you know, we've heard about mechanical harvesting, we've heard about robotic harvesting for years, but we've never seen it. We've never, no one's ever tried to sell us anything. No one's come to our farm and picked strawberries. We haven't seen that yet. So when is this going to happen? So I'm telling you, uh, in my business model, coming in the end of this year, well, December 2022 to July 2023, I plan on taking uh, a robot prototype to five different farms and harvesting a half an acre on multiple farms on the East Coast just to verify that everything's working as planned, that have the right speeds, the right durability and everything, to have a farm harvester functional and working. And then the following year, I plan to scale up, assuming everything works out, and then I get some investors to build a sufficient number of robots, start harvesting commercially for larger farms, larger farms being like you know, 10, 20 acres at a time, and then we'll go from there. And that is my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm here now, or if you have very specific questions about, uh, the people I've talked to generally have questions about how fast and how much does it cost and things like that, and I'm happy to answer all those questions. The, uh, the one thing I've realized talking to farmers here today and in Florida is uh, geographically separated farms will charge, uh, we're, the cost of labor varies quite a bit from state to state based on the, the laws and regulations. And I'm trying to charge a constant rate across all states, so I'm realizing that some states might be more viable than others as far as how much labor rates I can charge, at least compared to other states. But that is an issue that uh, I'll have to address when the time comes. But, yep. Yeah, so it's like, let's say you got all your funding, you know, you're sitting on like 150 of these robots, Right. What I'm trying to shoot for my, my input in there, how much of the you negative know, you're saying can't quite, like what, what are you guys thinking of above charging? So, so the, the number that I've, that I've started with is $5 a flat, so that's actually less than your dollar a quart rate. So a dollar a quart would be great uh, for, for as far as a target for how much, and that's a dollar a quart. So you're paying labor as a dollar a quart to harvest, so right? Yeah, so, so yeah, we're, and we're aiming for, I'm saying $5 a flat plus some way to sort it. So it's in that, it's definitely in that ballpark you're thinking of a dollar quart. And how, and how long can it take for? So these, 
uh, robots are designed to pick for 15 hours a day. Um, they they definitely can pick for they can pick for 24 hours a day uh, if we get them to the point where they're that durable. But for the first year, we're probably aiming for 15, assuming that we're going to have breakdowns. So on average, we'll be doing 15 hours a day. Uh, but as technology proves and it matures, we can push towards 20 hours a day even. And, uh, and of course, the rates will go up too. So the thing is, the slower the robot is, the more we're going to need to harvest the same number of strawberries. But our rate will vary in constant. So you, the farmers won't really have to worry about how fast. I mean, they will because we need to get all the strawberries picked on time. But we will get the strawberries picked. We'll just bring the appropriate number of systems to pick your field in that time. So right now, he's, so we're not doing quartz now. Right now we're just measuring at uh, strawberries per minute. And they're very slow right now because this is a, a pretty early prototype. We have a path to increasing the rate. So if you watch that video, he's, he picks, that robot picked uh, one strawberry about every 50 seconds, which you know is very slow. Uh, but we have a lot of uh, solutions to speed that up because right now we're focused on picking it very quickly, uh, picking it very accurately. So we don't want to go too fast because we want to see what's happening in the system. But as we start speeding up the process, we hope to get, so our target is to get one strawberry every 15 seconds, which still isn't a very fast rate. But if you compare it to an eight hour day, and you start doubling your time rates and adding more robots, it will be cost competitive, or it will be competitive with uh, manual labor. Can it pick in the rain? It can pick in the rain, in the dark, yep. So that's a complicated question, um, but if it depends. Uh, so a lot of farm, a lot of the future of farmers, they say they're going to go indoors. Um, and right now, there's very few indoor strawberry farms. There's some, but I don't know, maybe 99% of them are outdoors. Uh, and I'd say the plastic culture raised beds are fairly, or they're easier than like matted rows, for example, for us to harvest. If you go indoors and start having raised hydroponic beds everywhere, that's even more easy. That's a totally different solution than this, because now, now you're picking in a different environment. But so we're aimed towards like the solution right now. In the future, if they start going away from outdoor farms, then we'll have a, a dramatically different harvesting solution in that case. So um, when the robot is trying to replace labor, um, which I think might be a good thing, but labor is involved to adapt to any kind of change in the plant architecture and the plant configuration. Um, a robot will not. So I'm just wondering if you are actually tackling the right thing and not making it more cumbersome for the farmers if they start using this kind of thing. Because labor isn't just like, oh, you have, suddenly you have a, a successful harvesting for strawberries and you have like your yield is twice as much and you need to harvest them within 24 hours. It's just double the number of people that you can. Mm -hmm. um, you can't double the number of robots because of the speed they are. So I'm just wondering, are you planning to adapt to that? And, and especially with the structure of the plant, like, you know, like the plant you show, they have like a few leaves and the robot can see the berries. But most of the farms that I have seen, you have a bush of, of, of right. and the berries are really hiding into it. So how do you tackle that? Do you have like a hand on the robot that moves the leaf and just get it? Or so how so we have a few, well, you asked a bunch of questions, but first, the, uh, the, uh, as far as how many, how we find strawberries, and can we know, and we, saw, we started with an easy problem. We recognize th these are the brand new strawberry bushes. They don't have very many leaves, and they have lots of strawberries, so it was easy. Um, and you'll see the, the ones right next in the row, two rows down, those have a lot more leaves. Um, but we, the, the way we plan to solve that is we actually have a lot of cameras mounted all over the, the, the robot, so we can actually see multiple views simultaneously. And there's a camera on the arm, which we can actually circle with. And so the assumption is that if we see a straw, we'll see the strawberries with at least one of those cameras. And so we'll be, we'll be doing a lot of looking to find all the strawberries. And we have lights and everything to illuminate it. We, 
We've seen systems that actually will brush leaves back and forth or blow in the leaves to move them around. Uh, and that may be necessary, but right now, we believe based on some of the data we have that having cameras at five or six different angles and then one that rotates 360 degrees, that lets us find about 90% of them just by looking from a bunch of different angles at the same time. And then you talk about uh, adjusting, so you say, you come up with a plant that has twice the yield uh, all of a sudden or, or something changes. Um, part of the advantage to having this over a larger robot is we can just send twice as many robots to harvest it. So if you need twice as many laborers to solve a problem, you can just you can double the number of robots just as like you would be able to double the amount of laborers. Now, I'm not saying that we can make 100 robots in a day, for example. You could just hire 100 laborers in a day. Um, so we would have to have some resources already available or be prepared ahead of time for that type of change. So in the future, say we have our company has 100 robots and we're harvesting at a bunch of farms. This one farm says, hey, we need twice as many as we did before. We can do that as long as it's not more than we have, for example. So there are some limitations, but I think using the smaller system lets us be more flexible in that we can adapt to your scenario where you have a, a new, new development of strawberries that lets you grow more strawberries. We can still adjust to that, and we realize it'll take longer to harvest more strawberries, just like a laborer would. Um, but we would also be able to adapt a little bit better to that. And also, if things change color and things like that, it would take us some time to adapt, whereas people are really good at picking strawberries. I'm not going to argue with that. Um, but uh, we're going to try to adapt to all those changes as they come. And we think this style is more flexible than, say, a, a robot that's really large and harvests many at the same time. So we know it's not perfect. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Terrence. Sure.